All right, back again to Bergson and the holographic theory of mind. This will be part 32 on time travel and its relation to Bergson. So we'll be looking at Bergson's model of time one more time, time flow in Bergson, understand its implication for travel in any direction, particularly in this case, travel to the past. And we'll be exploring the subject of magnetism and time why would magnetism retard or accelerate biological growth, which it does, and the possibility of travel to the future and the possible electromagnetic basis for this. So let's begin. The subject is obviously only partially tied to Bergson. It's, I'm going there because it's an opportunity to, re to reflect a bit more on Bergson's model of time. It's all, always been a question to me relative to Bergson, probably since it's just kind of obviously hanging in the mind recesses of anyone interested in time, if no more from the ubiquity of the topic. The stargates, back to the future, time machines, the famous Philadelphia experiment where supposedly in World War II, a ship was momentarily disappeared and then reappeared. Uh, discussion theory, even in mainstream physics on the possibility of time travel so we'll look at Bergson's implications for travel. Then we'll look at what I think is the best guess at what's possible and how. That's not based on special relativity and general relativity, which as anyone who's seen my 8a and 8b parts, simply I simply cannot regard as valid. And another criteria in the theory publicly available, not buried in a deep state science dungeon. Given this, it will take us to another aspect of Ken Wheeler's thoughts on the magnetic and dielectric field, which we looked at in number 22. So the distinguishing feature of Bergson's time is that each moment is the reflection of the previous moments, like the notes of a melody, where each note is the reflection of the previous notes in the series. To quote him, might it not be said that if these notes succeed one another, yet we perceive them in one another, and that their totality may be compared to a living being whose parts, although distinct, permeate one another, just because they are so closely connected. We can conceive then of succession without distinction, and think of it as a mutual penetration, interconnection, and organization of elements, each one of which expresses the whole, and cannot be distinguished or isolated from it except by abstract thought. Such is the account of duration that one would be given by a being who was ever the same and ever changing and who had no idea of abstract space. This concept is intrinsically linked to quality, this notion of each note reflecting the whole. Take a melody like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. If I focus on the last note of the melody and alter the timing of the preceding notes, the quality of that last note changes. In fact, the perception of the whole changes. It's simply not the same. I noted earlier, it is this aspect of real time, concrete time, where Bergson is duration, that supports our experiences of qualities like mellow, or feelings, a mellow song, violin, room, wine, personality, or being, like our cat. It is the buildup over time, the interpenetration, the permeation of succeeding moments while listening to a song or experiencing someone's being. This cannot be supported in the discrete model of time. It is time as another dimension of an abstract space. That is the metaphysic underlying AI, cognitive science, physics. This is the classic metaphysic I've noted before, where space is simply conceived as a continuum of mathematical points a 3D continuum, and motion across this continuum, like, like that of our wine bottle, is conceived as a, a succession of points, the bottle occupying point after point, and where between any two pair, any pair of these points, one has to insert yet another line of points, ad infinitum, an infinite regress. And then time becomes a fourth dimension of this structure, a dimension of points where the points are now instants. This is the classic metaphysic. 
Mellow, however, cannot exist as a static instant in an abstract series of discrete instants. That is some form of time, or called time. It cannot be represented in a static structure, or more to the point, more precisely, as a series of static structures. For this cannot support the interpenetration, the permeation, the buildup over time that creates the quality we term mellow or happiness or whatever. Abstract symbols in a timeless abstract space trying to represent mellow feelings, etc., never going to happen. In Time and Free Will, it was this focus on our experience, our consciousness, that Heidegger seems to have fixed upon. In our discussion of Heidegger in number 27, I noted Heath Macy's analysis, namely that Heidegger held that Bergson's model only applied to individual consciousness, not as a model of time on a universal scale, not something that physics needs to consider. It was as though he, Heidegger, had only read Time and Free Will and not Chapter 4 of Matter and Memory. I know that you might be able to read Time and Free Will this way, kind of. In reality, even Time and Free Will makes clear this is a model of the time transformation of the universal field itself. In Time and Free Will, coordinate with this melodic model, Bergson had noted, because each new moment is a reflection of the preceding history of the flow, each new moment is absolutely new. No moment can ever be repeated. But we project backwards upon our conscious experience through our framework of objects in the abstract space. The abstract space is our projection frame. And we see each note in a melody as mutually external, repeatable, a repeatable object or state. Ten middle C's are struck on the piano in succession. We see the spatial cause, the same finger hitting the same key, producing the same result. Thus, this flow in time becomes divided conceptually, conceptually into ten mutually external, repeatable notes. But our actual experience is of an organic whole. If, again, as in the twinkle, twinkle, little star example, if one note is held slightly longer than the others, the experience, the quality of the whole is changed, as Bergson noted in Time and Free Will. The notes interpenetrate, and each current note is a reflection of the preceding notes in the series. It is this conscious experience that is telling us the reality, not the abstraction derived from space. The finger is not the same finger from note strike to note strike, or the same paw. The piano key is not even the same key. The string is not the same piano string. Nothing in the universe is the same from moment to moment. It is only practically the same. A practicality is defined by a scale of time defined by perception, a scale defined by the dynamics of the brain. Again, the buzzing fly, as opposed to a heron-like fly that the brain dynamics given a high enough energy state, could also impose. To turn this practical, this middle scale, and concepts derived therefrom into philosophical gospel, that is, the notion of repeatability in causality, or into metaphysical gospel, or worse, physical gospel, this is the problem. Repeatability is the essence of causation. Again, noted by Bergson in Time and Free Will. A billiard ball, given the exact same forces, the vectors, goes the same place every time. But how to achieve the exact sameness? Consider the entirety of space taken at an instant. Again, our cubes of space taken at an instant. But how long is the instant? I can descend scales until the duration is so minute, so infinitesimal, that my cube of space exists so, for so infinitesimally short a time, one millionth, one trillionth of a second, whatever, that it has nothing left of the qualitative aspect of the perceived world in that cube. 
In fact, I'm stripping all quality as I descend. So stripping all quality as I descend scales of time, the buzzing fly of our normal scale becomes the immobile fly, or barely flapping his wings, then becomes a cloud of electrons, then it's become quark events, then an ensemble of strings. That each cube is becoming a tinier and tinier slice of time, infinitesimally small, one trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, thus becoming ultimately so many algebraical relations. I end with a virtually homogeneous, featureless, quality-less quality cube of space, then another, then another. I'm close to achieving absolute repeatability, for I'm absolutely near the concept of quantity. In quantity, I treat every apple, for example, as exactly alike, a unit, for the sake of achieving a sum. It is a sum of units. All qualitative differences in the apples are ignored, stripped away, for the sake, in, for the sake of achieving a sum of units. Three apples or three cubes of space. But my nearly homogeneous cubes of space appearing one after the other after the other leave me problems. For the ideal limit of the extent and time of each of these cubes is this, instantaneity. But absolute instantaneity is again an abstract mathematical point. That is, each of these cubes would have the existence of a mathematical point, the duration, the length thereof. And at this abstract mathematical point, there is, again, no time. Therefore, as we saw Linz argue, there can be no change. The universe is frozen. Those cubes, each that cube is frozen. Space one is frozen. How then do I get cube one to transition to cube two, which has a slightly different configuration of, say, particles, and then to a new cube three, and so forth? Because everything in cube one is stuck, frozen, at a mathematical point where there can be no beginning and no end, I can have no motion. So I have achieved my repeatability, but at enormous expense. How do I get cube one to generate or cause cube two? How does cube one force the existence of cube two? In other words, how do I bind the future to the present? Bergson noted in time of free will, this was Descartes' problem. How do I ensure an order across one instant to the next. How do I get one instant after the next? And Descartes had to invoke God to bring this about. So here, the implications for time are obviously at a universal scale. To Heidegger, this should have been obvious already without the later matter and memory in its chapter four. But to the point, we have nothing here like the abstract frozen, static, all of the future, present, past, 4D space-time block of special relativity, in which one can almost visualize something whizzing back and forth. Certainly, roving consciousness modules going back and forth in time have been proposed, if nothing more than to account for the flow of experience, the flow of my words the flow of Kang there as his mouth goes up and down. We have to account for the flow in that static structure. But this fourth dimension, at each instant of, instant of its extent, is in reality a qualitative accumulation, and it is inextended. It does not have actual physical extension. How then would a physical thing like our body travel or move backwards in or through this dimension. And a bit worse, as we noted earlier in Matter and Memory, as Bergson described it, all motion is the transference of a state rather than of a thing. The motion of a thing, be an object, an object, a billiard ball, a person is rather the transference of a state in the global motion of the whole, like a wave. It is the, the whole field, the whole universe, 
is changing and and the motion of objects in this hole are merely transfer, transfers of state like waves. It is the hole that is changing like a kaleidoscope. So a body moving backwards through the past extent of this universal change of this hole is a complete misconception of motion in this field. That is, there are not independent bodies that can move against or through opposite to the motion of the whole. The notion that classical laws of physics are reversible gets thrown in here. I can move my egg two feet to the right. My motion equation describes it. Now I can move it back again. Same equation. It's reversible. Nearly all physics equations seem to have this capability, reversibility. But the egg at finish is not the same egg as at start. Nothing is the same, especially when taken to small enough scale, not the middle scale of our experience. Hard boil the egg with a laser as it moves two feet or have it break against the wall. Can I reverse this? Physics says, well, very improbable due to the second law or entropy, but only improbable. It's, it's a statistical improbability of putting all the molecules back together again. Not likely to happen, but supposedly nothing in physics prevents this. It doesn't matter. I still do not have the same egg, even if I could put it back together again. The time of physics is nothing but an abstraction, divorced from the melodically transforming field, from the dielectric magnetic dynamic ether, divorced from quality. So the current note, the present note of this universal transformation is, as it were, the current note of a melody, of a symphony, playing as the cosmos. You can visualize the whole cosmos as basically a giant symphony with a multiplicity of melody lines of voices. And that note then, the present is a qualitative reflection of this vast history, this whole. You can reverse the symphony, play it backwards, but it is not the same, nor is the final state of the cosmos start to end, then from end back to start, or could we do that, going to be the same. This is the temporal metaphysic, this model of the symphony, the melody. Yes, it's a metaphor, but the right metaphor is all important. Physics metaphor, to be a little bit succinct here, is as though a bunch of Legos in a box. You can move them around in the, in the box, that is, the box being the abstract space. Reverse the motions. All is the same. Entropy, a broken egg has a small glimpse of reality. In other words, it's, it's hard to reverse this, they understand that, but nevertheless, it's allowed. Statistically, this metaphor allows then all sorts of conceptual games, but it's simply a bad metaphor. So the cosmic symphony, so to speak, trails behind the current note that is the present, the present note. But in an extended past, a dimension that is no longer the physical, as we define matter. Matter, of course, being always the present, the present instant. But back to the question, can we conceive of a physical object, a body, a time machine, whatever, moving backwards through this non-physical dimension, against, so to speak, the very flow of the symphony, which is the motion, quote unquote, of this object, quote unquote. Well, in these terms, it can make little sense. And I can think of no other terms. Time travel to the past just looks impossible. This seems to be the implication of Bergson's model. But to the future, well, there may be a way. We're going to continue here with concepts we started to explore in number 18 in the history of electromagnetism with Eric Dollard, Maxwell Heaviside, Tesla Steinmetz, 
followed by number 22 with Ken Wheeler on magnetism and generally the notion, what is a field? Now, in one video, Ken makes a statement as such. Time is only the measure of magnitudes. Time does not actually exist. A shadow is not a thing in and of itself. By invocation, saying time is like a shadow. Shadow is but a posterior attribute. Time, like the shadow, is not an autonomous, prim autonomous principle. Okay, doesn't seem like Bergson. And we're going to see that there are th clashes here and things we have to resolve and may not be resolvable. But that makes it interesting. But let's go on. To quote again, Tesla said, space has no properties. The reasoning for this is that space is a posterior attribute, the expression of the loss of inertia, as we denote magnetism. Again, I'll remind you right now, inertia is not the normal meaning of inertia. Inertia represents pure potential. So he's actually saying the expression of the loss of potential, as we denote magnetism. Magnetism leaves space in its wake. The only thing that gives the universe magnitude is magnetism. In other words, the only thing that gives the universe volume and space is magnetism. So let's level set instantly. Bergson's holographic theory of matter and memory in 1896 was in the context of the ether. That was the reigning metaphor then. The no ether concept came via Einstein, so to speak, in 1905, roughly speaking, and via the strange movement that overthrew the ether by simultaneously burying the theory of electromagnetism held by Heaviside, Steinmetz, Thompson. That is what was buried, the dielectric magnetic counter space ether. So time is a measure of magnitude, as Ken says. Now this seems to clash with Bergson. Time as duration, as the melodic flow, is not measurable. This was the argument of time and free will. So we're equivocating here the meaning of time. The magnitudes we are deriving when we measure time, objective time, are purely spatial measurements. When we measure a year, we are noting simultaneities in space. That is, the Earth coming back to the same position relative to the sun. Each time the Earth recurs back to that position relative to the sun, we call it a year. We are comparing positions in space. Just like I can de determine that I'm going to define a second as each one second goes by each time that parrot's tail passes a post. Again, a spatial simultaneity. And of course, if I speed up the turntable, double the speed of the turntable, the second What's measured a second is one half of what it used to be. But still, I'm measuring, merely measuring simultaneities in space. So we are not measuring real time, or in Bergson's preferred terminology, duration, concrete, experience, psychological time. We cannot measure psychological time nor, for that matter, the time transformation of the universal field, because this time transformation of the universal field shares precisely all the attributes of psychological time. That was the point of the previous dozen slides in Time and Free Will. We're talking about not simply a time that applies only to consciousness, but happens to be a time that all its attributes are simply also part of the universal flow of the field itself. So what we are measuring is a spatialized time, to simultaneities in space. This time is what we term objective time. But in this sense only can time be a measure of magnitude not psychological time, not the actual flow of the, and development, transformation, transformation development of the universe itself. Then Ken says, as we noted, time does not exist. So Ken is visualizing the dielectric 
with its counter space, of which magnetism is the expression or is expressed from. Again, noting his model here, we have the hyperboloidal figure, the hourglass, the expression of centrifugal and centripetal force or, or energies coming from the inertial plane and then expressing as the donut of magnetism. So in each case, we have the donut of magnetism circling this whole expression of force, centrifugal and centripetal flow flowing back in and out of the poles. And this all arises from the green line, the dielectric inertial plane, which is where there is, in fact, no magnetism. In fact, a little demonstration that I happen to run across that he shows, there's a little box of pins. He stuck his hand underneath the pins, and you see they rise up to make it look like his fingers. Then if he takes a magnet and uh, puts it toward the pins, where again, the line going across here is the initial plane, uh, one sees that the pins do not rise along the plane of inertia. There is no magnetism along that plane. So magnetism here is the expression of the loss of inertia, he says. Inertia, again, being taken here as pure potential not the normal expression of inertia. Pure potential, the pure potential of the dielectric of counter space. And along this plane of inertia, he is saying there is no time. So this expression of the magnetic becomes spatial volume, the volume underlying every atom. That is, atoms are not just filled with empty space, but with magnetism. All phenomena of change, that is time, butterflies flying, flies buzzing, are expression of this mag magnetism, the growth, shall we say, from the dielectric inertial plane. So yes, this phenomenal time clearly exists, as Ken acknowledges, and it is magnitude, change, value. But is the dielectric counter space itself just static, not dynamic? That's the question. Obviously the plane of inertia, counter space, is mysterious. But one suspects it too can be considered dynamic. For example, see Kessler's book I've mentioned, The Energy of Space. This is a profound questions, ultimately. I think Bergson's, in the last analysis, we always come back to motion, still holds to this aspect of the ether, and thus of time. But at any rate, time is an expression of magnitude, and magnetism from out the dielectric is very real. Ken says, take time travel. It is absolutely irrefutable that since magnitude moves in only one direction, Force and motion only have one direction. As the ancient Indians said, you can never set your feet in the same waters over again. Magnitude has only one direction. Very constant with what we just discussed with Bergson. Again, time travel cannot go in the direction of the past, but the future. Ken argues this, that magnetism provides a way. Firstly, there's some, already some evidence that magnetism has a relation to time. Well, yes. In the 1970s, Ken noted, Albert Davis and Walter Rawls published three, three works, Magnetism and its Effect on the Living System, The Magnetic Effect, and The Magnetic Blueprint for Life, 1974, 1977, 1979. These books describe the results of years of experiments on the effect of magnetic fields on growth. Chicken eggs, for example, no, Exposed to the North Pole, slowed hatching by one to two days. They were skinny, sensitive, they eat sparingly. South Pole exposed, they were fat and hardy. Worms, exposed to the North Pole, they would literally eat their way out of the styrofoam cups they were in and its dirt to get out. Seeds will be affected, as we'll discuss. Seeds, Wheeler shows 
his own experiments on alfalfa seeds. Place a rolled up seed packet on the right side where the chalk marks are there on the picture. And this, the red side there of that magnet is the North Pole. Of the red, the opposite side is the South Pole. So when exposed to the North Pole for, it can be just as little as, little as half an hour, what you end up with with the alfalfa seeds is more dead seeds. They're watery, a slight chemical taste, a nasty aftertaste. And the South Pole pole seeds, more robust, much better tasting, germinate faster, faster growing, and fewer dead seeds. The exposure can be just for half an hour. It has to be taped to the centrifugal ed edge of divergent magnetism. So right on the edge of the chalk marks there. Uh, and um, either one, 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 either side, red or blue, north or south, of either polarity to get direct, correct results. You can do this to the seeds only or during sprout slash germination growth. Again, for, for Ken, the entire universe is made of atoms. Inside every atom is the magnetoelectric volume, the same thing that is inside every magnet. Therefore, we can influence nature through every way possible and imaginable through magnetodielectric manipulation. Countless experiments were done by Rawls and Davis showing that seeds were affected, worms, birds even. If you want tomatoes with low acid content, you expose the seeds to the south pole of a magnet. They were able to repeat these experiments over and over. They got a patent on, on a magnetic bar that would roll over the top of alfalfa seeds. So they have a patent for accelerating the growth of the alfalfa seeds. Yet it's very difficult to find these books. Ken W. Ken says they were suppressed almost assuredly, certainly, and he's not, he says he's not a conspiracy theorist, by the government, the FDA. You can see them on Amazon used for about 40 bucks and up and up and up. My, my wife, who's a librarian using WorldCat, cannot find them in any library in the world. You can find them on archive.org because Ken put them out there. So this is kind of resonance of the strange history of electromagnetism we discussed in 18, where strangely enough, all progress on electromagnetism seems to have come to an end. One wonders where an orthodox theory of magnetism, is there a model of the difference between the North and South Pole of a magnet, such that you would get these different effects? Question. Doing a little search. Yahoo, the best answer. There is no physical difference. If you want to distinguish which is which, first you need a reference. And that is the Earth's magnetic field or compass to show the field. The North Pole of the compass is attracted to the Earth's South Pole, mislabeled the North Pole up in Canada. And then he goes on to describe how to use a compass to find the North Pole of a magnet. And Quora, an answer from a physics professor, Jay Brewer, University of British Columbia, our convention is that lines of magnetic flux emerge from the North Pole and return to the South Pole, as the diagram shows. Lines emerging from the North Pole, the red, returning back to the South Pole, the blue. Another Quora answer, another physics professor, M. Barton, Despite being the original motivation for the idea of poles in physics, the poles of a magnet are fake relative to the final version of the concept, which is a point which field lines either exclusively merge, emerge from or exclusively disappear into, as the diagram shows. From outside the magnet, it looks like the field lines are emerging from the North Pole and disappearing into the South Pole, but Internally, they're recirculating from south back to north. That is, it's akin to, and he shows a faucet hanging in midair. In other words, a self-running faucet with no source of water. That is a mystery. But we're going to see this recirculating concept 
far more delineated and, and more fully and completely in Ken Wheeler, as we saw in number 22, and we'll peek at again. And we noted, again in 22, Richard Feynman's quote-unquote explanation of magnetism when asked, where he ends up talking about Aunt Minnie sliding on the ice and the difficulty of making an explanation of magnetism. One can find that on YouTube. But why would this explain a different effect on tomatoes? North Pole retardation, South Pole acceleration. Well, we have to touch on Ken's thoughts on magnetism and time travel simultaneously with the seeds to get a picture. When you expose the seeds to a pole, this causes a temporal displacement depending on which pole, north or south. That is, time is changing, either slowing or speeding. Now, though we're talking poles, a magnet doesn't actually have poles, as we sort of saw the physicist with the faucet, Barton, imply. It has the inverse of counter space, or inertia. The plane of inertia exists right at the center of the hyperboloid, or the dielectric hyperboloid expression of dielectric force. Right at the center, there is no magnetism at this plane or line, as we saw, it's the dielectric accretion disk, dielectric electricity. It is the point of spatial divergence, the divergence point of magnetism. The inverse of this hyperboloid is the donut, the force divergence, the filling out of space, magnetism. Now, if I cut the magnet, the entire structure instantly reforms. This entire hyperboloidal, um, toroidal structure. Now, normally this idea is attempted to be captured in current physics by the notion of aligning domains. I send a magnetic force field B through a chunk of iron and all the little magnetic domains, red and blue, now align. The difficulty is this is an infinite operation. I can cut and cut and cut, and always that structure will reform. So a moment's thought tells you that this conception, the little domain conception, is entirely inadequate because ultimately those domains shrink to an almost infinitely small point, which tells you that in reality, something far more um, is going on. In fact, it's, we're talking in virtually holographic implication here, so to speak, analogous to a hologram where every point is yet the whole. So the donut not only extends out, but is precessing like a top where the axis cycles around at a frequency. This frequency per Ken is the Lamore frequency, as he terms it, and we'll be coming back to this. So Ken sees nature as working in the framework of phi. The golden ratio of phi is ubiquitous in the natural world, in sunflowers, seashells, the design of moths, even down in the right-hand corner, the structure of the water molecule, where we have a ratio of one to five. To him, this is the teaching of the ancients, of Plato. So phi, the world is one, the starting point, the line, or as we shall see, the divided line. And I'll put a link to another derivation of Plato's divided line in the references. So the line is now divided into parts A and B. And in the golden ratio, A is to B as A plus B is to A. And so we end with this ratio, A over B equals A plus B over A equals 1.618, 1.618 being the phi number. So for him, the most fundamental aspect of nature, the expression of magnetism is within the framework of phi. That is, this is a fundamental symmetry postulate. Just like the 
derivation and conjecture as to the structure of the periodic table of elements was a symmetry postulate in science. So for Ken, talking magnetism here, the proportionality between centrifugal divergence and centripetal, centripetal convergence always follows the golden ratio proportionality. So let's see if we can follow this as it gets a little uh, difficult to actually understand its derivations, but we shall see. So Ken argues the expression of force from the inertial plane occurs at a ratio of one to phi, exactly as an egg. It is necessitated pressure remediation. It is the reciprocating precessional hyperboloid. So looking at the sim simple picture at the top there with the donut and the hourglass, the hourglass being the hyperboloid and the expression of the dielectric force, and the donut being the inverse, the, don the uh, torus expect expressing the magnetic force. And then to the right of that, a more complicated picture of the flow, the dielectric coming from each pole and then circling back in again to the opposite pole with the uh, yellow circles being the donut force, the toroidal force surrounding the hole. So in the egg picture, we were focusing on the south pole flow, the south pole field. And as he says, we have a ratio of centrifugal divergence from out the south pole of phi. So at bottom, centrifugal divergence, but at the top, then centrifugal convergence into the center of the North Pole. And at the North Pole, and here I have the red egg, as best I could do an egg, um, the, the North Pole field, we have a centrifugal divergence of 1 over phi, or 0.618, and centrifugal divergence then, but entering at the South Pole centripetally. So Notice we're very much what the physicist we mentioned was talking about, who had the faucet hanging in midair of the actual cycling out and back within, into from out one pole and back into the next and vice versa. That uh, is the true expression of the magnetic field. So we have phi at the south pole of 1.618 and 1 over phi at the north pole of uh, 0.618, which means, he says, at the north pole we have red shift, at the south pole we have blue shift, and so we have spatial temporal compression at the south pole since we have phi versus 1 over phi. The entire system is 1, 0.618 times 1.618 being 1. So the entire system is 1. Ken shows how this field extrapolates out with his little toy, his ring toy. Here he says we have inertia, counter space, infinitely thin, the green ring in the picture to the right. Or as Faraday called it, di the dielectric field. He lays it down, then lets it extrapolate out. This is what you see in the ferrous cell, slightly compressed, looking down from the top, the picture of the magnetic field under the ferrous cell. This is reciprocating and pulsating at extremely high frequency, again, invoking the Lamour frequency. By the Lamour frequency, he says, we mean this reciprocation. Now, let me make a note here. Ken has done a couple thousand short vids not all on magnetism by any means, many on cameras and uh, some on Buddhism. And the info for this time travel related model has to be gathered and integrated from uh, the vids that I can see relate. He says this is going to be in this fourth edition of his book, but he's been working on this for some time and I suspect it's getting longer and longer, so it's not yet there. So uh, just note we have to deal with the limitations I've got with uh, integrating, collating, extracting. Let's pause here for a second on Ken Wheeler, procession, a little more frequency. Ken is visualizing, I think, this hyperboloid slash donut precessing like a top 
that is moving around another axis, where the cycle of this axis is the frequency. For example, 42.5 million complete cycles of this axis per second. Or, as we just saw, just the oscillating reciprocation as precessing. An ambiguity in this case, but is either actually the Lamore frequency? Kind of and kind of not. A particle can be conceived as having a circular current. And there's a circular current for the particle. Its magnetic moment is a vector. Direction is given by the right-hand rule. If you look at the little diagram, you can see a hand and the thumb pointing upward along the red arrow. The hand wrapped around the direction of the current, just giving the rule for the direction of the magnetic moment. Placed in a magnetic field, you'll be zero here. The particle, there's a torque. The particle now precesses like a top about an axis, tending to align with the magnetic field's direction. The cycle that this axis rotates, 42.5 million per second, for this particular particle is the Lamore frequency. But this frequency varies as a function of the charge mass ratio of the particle and the strength of the magnetic field, B. So we have a little table here where we have a particle like hydrogen with the, with the 42.5 megahertz. But then you see there's other particles. Helium, for example, it goes the opposite direction and it's mighty minus 32 megahertz, etc. The table is set Therefore, a B equals one, or one a one Tesla field of magnetic force. And the equation then, F0 equals gamma beta zero, where F0 is the Lamore frequency for each particle, and beta zero is the field strength, and the, and the gamma there is the gyro magnetic ratio, which is a constant specific to each specific particle, as, as we see in the right-hand column of the table. And since uh, we have one Tesla, then fundamentally notice if we have one Tesla, F0 is one times the gyro magnetic ratio of 42.5 or 42.5 megahertz. But if we were set at the one V to 1.5 Tesla, V0, um, then 1.5 times 42.58 and we get 63.87 megahertz. So again, the frequency varies as a function of the mass, charge mass ratio of the particle and the field strength. So a problem here for, for Ken. This precession is not the precession. This precession we're talk, just talking about here with B0 is not the precession of Kw's hyperboloid or his reciprocation. No, in the, in the Lamore case, the magnetic field B0 is causing the torque on a particle and thus precession. But in the hyperboloid donut, it's already the magnetic field. For the donut to precess to hold the analogy, we would need another field from where acting as B0, so to speak, affecting in this case what is already a magnetic field. And a precessing field seems not required to cause the particle to precess it as if you're saying the field is precessing like Ken is. Well, in the Lamore case, we don't need a precessing field. We just need the force vector specified by B0 there, a magnetic force vector causing the torque. Ken notes that the precession is of the, the dielectric inertial plane and again at 42.5 megahertz, very high, the Lamore frequency. You can see his, his pictures there of, the, of a uh, slanted dielectric inertial plane precessing. But the inertial plane is counter space. It is a field and thus as Dollard noted, as we noted number 18, has no measurable properties. So in my opinion, it's a mystery here as to the nature of the force analogous to B0 that would exert a torque 
on the inertial plane, hyperboloid. And as again, as noted, the 42.5 megahertz only holds for, in, in this case, hydrogen, and is different for other charge mass ratio particles. And one could ask, why is this 42.5 for the inertial plane, which has no charge mass at all? So one can see why an occasional comment are asked for any proof of this precession and of its actual frequency, 42.5 megahertz, that can assist on, that can, can provide. Yet Dollard noted, and as we saw in number 18, you cannot ex understand electromagnetism without the notion of counter space, and therefore the dielectric inertial plane. So we've got a problem here. And I'm just going to move on, noting the above caveats. For a form of precession is critical in Ken Wheeler's time travel model, which we want to look at. So Ken says, there's three things we can state about time. Firstly, we can end it at the point of inertia, where there is no time. We have a non-Cartesian, atemporal plane of inertia where time has no meaning, no existence, no notion of where and when these are abstractions for phenomenal beings with existence based in time. So this is a profound statement and an interesting question and problem because if there's no time at this counter space, counter spatial plane, that is no motion, if it's just static, we're back to some very interesting problems as we've already noted. So this is an interesting question, but we'll move on. The actual inflation, number two, or progress of time, which we all understand, but of course we don't understand. If we describe this actual inflation or progress of time as objective time under the classic metaphysic, we don't understand it. Three, we can create a large enough polarized, coherent displacement of time Time still moves on, but we are able to retard that time using electromagnetic retardation, where we are able to have a bubble of polarized time, a bubble of polarized time, whereby it is still inflating, time still progresses, but at a rate that is significantly, significantly less than all surrounding magnitudes, whereby you would be able to travel in time by entering this bubble of the polarized field and exit it, cutting the current and exiting at a future point in time. So time travel is possible, but only in one direction. So an immediate note here, with this field surrounding my kitchen, and I enter it on January 1st, 2019, and exited it at March 30th, 2021, two years later, I cannot go back in time in the conception we're about to explore to January 1st, 2019, and get rich on my NCAA bracket picks for the years 2019, 2020, and 2021. There's simply one direction. One cannot go back, travel back in time. And if I left my wife there, she would have to catch up with me, aging two years to catch up with me. So Ken, describing this notes precession as the spinning top as we've seen and says there is magnetic precession at the center of the hourglass figure there is no time as we've noted as the dielectric plane and this precession is a frequency again as we said the Lamore frequency and then he points to the equation we've already seen the equation for precession in megahertz over teslas by teslas teslas being a, a measure of magnetic field strength There's the equation. And we've seen that, what we just saw. Again, where B0 is the field strength in Teslas, gamma the magnetic geomagnetic ratio in megahertz over Teslas, and it's a constant specific to each particle. And he says we can change things by increasing power, that is the field strength, B0. So remembering magnetism, all magnitude, the change in magnitude, the f thus phenomenal time issues from or inflates from, as he says, and returns to the dielectric plane of inertia. He says we, we can have polarized time along the North Pole, a 
time of 1 over phi, pointing to the, the left egg there. And at this, along the south pole, a time of phi squared, or 2.618, or 1 over phi relative to phi squared, relative to the rest of the ambient world we all live in, which is phi. Remember, he's simply saying phi is at the basis of the ambient world. Now, again, another little problem here. I, I've noticed the use of phi squared here along the south pole seems to be different from the phi of slide 25, the, the development of this we already went through. I'm not sure why. If something changed in his mind or I missed something, maybe it's in the fourth edition, but we'll go with this. And a visual of the phase variance, we noted north shift, south shift, and the poles. Here we see north pole and south pole under a ferrous cell. And he says at the right, the south pole, at the left, the north pole. The south, because of the well-defined, he can see it's the south because of the well-defined bowl shape formation and due to the brighter side at the far right. So again, du duplicate to the phase variance to the, to the geomagnetic precession. What was actually affecting the living organisms that Davis and Rawls studied? The uh, tomatoes, for example. Given field coherency, we have polarized time, like you can, a rate of one over phi in the system as we discussed earlier, and a rate of one over phi squared in the normal human world. Now, I don't know where this one over phi squared came from. I might have missed it in a, a video that I didn't see, but we'll go with that. So along the North Pole, rarefaction. Along the South Pole, compression, time compression, as we saw earlier, at a rate of one to five. Again, I'm not sure where this rate came from. A ratio of phi and the south pole to one in the north. This acceleration effect will take place at a ratio of four to five to one. So thus the seed acceleration at the south pole. But, he says, it is the case that we can actually change the Lamour frequency, pointing to the right egg. We're able to change and expand that bubble of time. If we were able to compress by power application, by changing the Lamour frequency, disproportionately affecting the polarized bubble of a ship, and I suspect he's thinking of the Philadelphia experiment, or an entity in a fixed spot on the Earth. Let me indulge here in a little bit of conspiracy theory or question. In the Philadelphia experiment, as far as I know, I ran across something that I couldn't find now. It started with shipyards in World War II applying huge amounts of electrical power at times in the construction of ships. And workers were noticing that tools, hammers, wrenches, etc., were simply disappearing. And this led to investigations. A physicist by the name of Brown, an ether theorist, as I understand it, was brought in to try to explain this phenomena. This purportedly led to this entire experiment of disappearing a ship. It, it seems to, seems to involve von Neumann, Tesla himself. And of course, we're right in the heart of the now disappeared electromagnetism. But that's an aside. Where we have a two gigahertz field on the right versus a nominal field of 120 megahertz or so on the left by increasing the lag. In a field where there's precession, you have a lag effect. In a normal field where we have, say, 120 megahertz, as he says, what if you were actually able to change the field polarization by power application to have a ratio of phi cubed to one over phi to the minus cube? That is to say, as far as I can see, he is in inverting the normal polarization. We would have, then, within this temporal bubble of polarized time, we would have a phase disparity as opposed to a normal disparity, as 
on the left hand case and we'd have like a two gigahertz gyro magnetic precession and what would that mean that would mean that any entity any entity within this volume of field coherency of applied power would be experiencing slowed slowed time by changing a little more frequency as he says to the application of power we are actually able to change the phase geometry or phase disparity of an entity in a specific volume this is phase disparity by the application of electromagnetic retardation or emrs ken terms this by the application of power imagine that eggy says so this is depicting if you could actually squash it that is without breaking the shell via the power we change the disparity in time lag in an entity or volume such that at its leading front we would have temporal compression and at the trailing front we would have temporal displacement so notice we've inverted the case between the left hand and the right hand egg at the at the phi squared 120 megahertz roughly egg we've got temporal compression at the trailing edge on the right case the two gigahertz case we've got temporal displacement and vice versa for temporal compression or in other words slowing now at the trailing edge for the right hand case and acceleration on the trailing edge for the phi squared 120 megahertz case to achieve this it seems that t fields t and t to the minus three are are significant that is they seem to indicate two different fields of different power applied to achieve a, this differential effect on the poles that is on the centrifugal and centripetal centripetal force flow of the two poles so it appears that the t field is a field of very strong power t plus plus say and the t minus three is a field of very low power unfortunately he doesn't ever quite get to this in his explanation and i, I couldn't find it in any of the other youtubes or vids that he's, that he's made i have to know too that in reality phi cubed and one over phi to the minus cube are the same numerical value 4.2358 so, so the two different values he's showing in the right hand egg are in reality the same and I don't think he intended that I'm showing why that's the case in the next line that phi to the minus cube is, equi is equivalent to one over phi cubed and therefore when you carry that out you end up with the same value but so I think the difference is clearly intended in terms of value for denoting the, the phase disparity effect so maybe he just meant to say phi to the minus cube so that wish to be clarified just a note on that so outside the bubble time is proceeding normally the fly is buzzing by as per the normal world all processes in the white body normal speed everything in the outside world going at normal speed but inside the bubble time again is the expression of magnitude slash magnetism is slowed if we could peer inside things are moving more slowly we'd have a heron like fly the, the fly flying by the the guy in the bubble is barely moving the guy in the bubble is barely moving all processes within the body of our guy in the bubble are slowed down so after two years shall we say of the power on starting say 1 1 2018 Turn the power off. It's now 1 1 2020, and a guy is in the future. If, as Ken noted, because of the great energies we're dealing with, the tremendous magnitude of power, your brain is not fried. So that's something that would have to be worked out. So, yes, there are problems and clarities, things to ponder here. It seems, in my opinion, that the origin, nature, and value of magnetic field precession, what Ken likes to call the Lamore frequency, needs further work, clarification. Along with my several caveats, I've noted the theory is not as coherent, clear as I first hope it, hoped it might be, yet intuitively it seems onto something. At least 
We are looking at an attempt to penetrate the mystery of magnetism and the dielectric. That is, we're bringing back the electromagnetic science that has been conveniently submerged. And the plus, in my opinion, it is quite consonant with Bergson and his temporal metaphysic. And this, even with, even with the difficult implications of the dielectric inertial plane or counter space, or as Ken says, there is no time, but which yet seem tantalizingly resonant with the virtual of Bergson as well. So all this for something for someone to explore, resolve, and expand. In the process, we've hit Plato and possible implications therein. Ken terms himself a metaphysician, a Neoplatonic Platonist. Ken, I'm sure, knows little of Bergson or of his Bergson's metaphysics. One can sense a clash. I've already touched it, slides 16 to 18. I was reminded then of another analysis of Plato, of his successor, Aristotle, and of their impact on the current modern mind. The very famous Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Five million copies sold worldwide. Quite an impact. In it, Piercing describes a veritable war for the mind, a war between the Platonist, who he didn't like, and a profound opposing insight of Phaedrus, the tragic hero of his book. It is a war with a strangely missing warrior, and one we should ultimately take a look at. Down the road, temporal consciousness still on the list, or in current memory research, physics and the holographic principle, QM's origin, adding Zen in the art, perhaps something else. You shall see. So next time we'll see. Until then, signing off.